Hello to all my future nurses out there. Today we're gonna cover different types of oxygen devices, okay? A lot of times when I get students in the lab, um, they confuse the different devices and they can't remember which one is which. So we're gonna talk about that and also we're gonna talk about indications for oxygen, all right? So for the purpose of this video, we're gonna cover nasal cannula, simple face mask, Venturi mask, 100% um, non rebreather, and your uh, trade collar, as well as I'm also gonna show you an Ambu bag, because a lot of students uh, tend to get those confused. And if you have any questions about other types of oxygen deliveries, there's several out there. Um, there's face tents and there's BiPAP, which I'm not gonna be showing or talking about today. If you have any questions about that, then you should definitely um, write a comment down below and I'll try to refer to that in the next video or even just respond to your comment, okay? A lot of you have been emailing me questions and that's always welcome, but it may be if you ask a question in the comments, somebody else might have the same question and so I can answer it for more than just one person. All right, so let's get started. So first of all, the first one we have is your nasal cannula, okay? And it comes in this packaging, and you'll know because it says nasal cannula. So right here it says nasal oxygen cannula. And you'll also be able to see these prongs here, which is the easiest way. A lot of times when I go into the supply closet, sometimes the extension tubing is in the same bin or you know it's in the same place. And so you always wanna make sure that you're not grabbing the extension tubing, that you're actually grabbing your nasal cannula. Very common in the hospital, you'll see patients on nasal cannula oxygen often because it has several advantages. And some of the advantages are that it allows the patient to be a little bit more free. The patient can still eat, the patient can still talk, um, the patient can still um, ambulate to the bathroom. That's when that extension tubing will come in and will apply that. And you wanna really recommend, sometimes I have to persuade my patients to use the oxygen when they go to the bathroom because if I have a patient who's sitting in bed and is short of breath, then of course when they're exerting themselves and they're out of bed, they are going to be more short of breath. And so you don't want them ambulating to the bathroom and not having oxygen support and then they get short of breath and now they're in the bathroom and it can be potentially dangerous for them, right? So you always want to encourage that if they're on oxygen while in bed, that when they're ambulating, they also have the oxygen on, okay? So how much does the nasal cannula deliver? Can anybody tell me? Often my students say, oh, it delivers two liters of oxygen. And that's because you've heard many times that a nurse can deliver up to two liters of nasal cannula oxygen without a doctor's order. However, that's not the most that the nasal cannula can provide. The nasal cannula can provide one to six liters per minute of oxygen. Okay, so it's one to six liters per minute. Um, and to be honest, when you have a patient who's sitting up, like Mr. Carl Shapiro here, who's sitting up and is gonna be on this long term, we usually stop about four to four and a half liters, um, and you're always gonna humidify that amount of oxygen because it's very dry. Oxygen is very dry and it's very irritating to the nares and they start to get nosebleeds. And I always equate, I always give the example of, Picture if somebody comes and blows in your nose constantly throughout the day, how uncomfortable that would be. And so that's what six liters of oxygen feels like, okay? Um, but I have seen six liters be delivered on a patient who maybe is getting a, a short procedure, having a short procedure done, and they give them a little bit of sedation or something, and they want to give them high flow oxygen. And so they'll give them six liters. Um, of oxygen through the nasal cannula, okay? Um, but typically about four, four and a half if my patient isn't doing well, and what does that mean? Is was my patient not doing well? Well, what would we be looking for? What were the reasons why we put the patient on oxygen in the first place? Well, an SVO2, right? We would definitely wanna put, I just dropped mine, but we would definitely wanna put a pulse oximeter on this patient to see what they are, um, you know, what their SVO2 is on room air as well as once you put the patient on oxygen, okay? The respiratory rate, I would always wanna compare before and after and while they're on the oxygen, um, what their respiratory rate is. And lastly, and most, and you know, as important, if not even more important, is their breathing, the lung sounds. I wanna to listen to the lungs because I can give this patient 100% oxygen, 
But if there's something going on in the lungs, if there's fluid in the lungs, then I'm just giving a patient oxygen. It's not really going to help them. Okay. I want to treat the problem. So if there's fluid in the lungs, we want to get a diuretic going, right? If I hear crackles and, um, and the, the doctor is thinking that this patient is in heart failure, I want to have some diuretics on board. Or if this is a dialysis patient, is an overload, they need to have dialysis done, or if this patient comes in and they're wheezing, they need to get a nebulizer, which I'll show you um, in a minute. And so you wanna make sure that you're giving the appropriate oxygen, but that also you're communicating with your provider to treat the problem as to why they need the oxygen in the first place, all right? So I'm gonna just show you how to put the nasal cannula on. First of all, here is my flow meter, okay? And it goes from 0 0.5 to 15 liters. And if I, there was actually oxygen in this wall, when I turn the dial to the left, the little silver ball that's here will go up and I'll set it for whatever amount of liters I would want to give to the patient. Okay? And then over here, this little green adapter here is called your Christmas tree. That's where you're going to connect your oxygen. So I'm connecting the oxygen and I'm gonna set it for, let's say if I'm doing two liters um, and I wanna make sure that it's coming through. Sometimes people raise it all the way just to um, so that you can hear the oxygen, but you wanna make sure that it's actually working. And then, so I'm gonna tell Mr. Shapiro, I'm gonna put some oxygen, okay? It's just gonna go in your nose, it doesn't hurt. And so I'm going to put this in the nares first, and then I'm gonna go around the ears. See if, make sure you can see that. I'll go around the ears, and then there's this little white um, um, I don't know, I guess adjuster or clip, whatever you want to call it, that'll go up so that you can fit it to the patient. Obviously, you don't want it too tight, but you want to make sure that it'll fit so it doesn't come off. Um, some of the disadvantages of the nasal cannula is that many times if patients forget that they have it on and they just take it off. And so you'll walk in the room and rather than the patient having it in their nose, they have it up here and they're oxygenating their forehead. I don't know if somebody maybe told them that they can grow more hair that way, or I don't know what it is, but many times it's just because it's very irritating and it dries their nose, and so they'll just you know move it out the way and they'll forget about it. Many times you'll see it above here or you'll see it on the floor. Um, you know, So you always wanna make sure that every time you walk into that room that you're checking to um, see that the nasal cannula is actually on. Also, if you have the patient on a SpO2 monitor and you notice at the nurse's station that their SpO2 is starting to drop, you're gonna to wanna to go over to the patient and see if they even have it in their nose because many times they don't and that's why their SpO2 will begin to um, decrease. The other thing is that depending on your patient, you know, some patients are either very edematous, even in the face, or they're very frail and so, you know, you can see indentations around the cheeks. Um, you also begin to see skin breakdown around the ears if they have it on for a long time. So that's gonna be part of your assessment when you have a patient on um, the nasal cannula is making sure that it's on, making sure that they're tolerating it okay, their nose is not getting super dry and they're not um, getting nosebleeds. Um, if they're on a high flow, like I said before, if they're on like a four or four and a half, you're gonna to wanna to humidify that oxygen um, for them. Other thing that I wanna stress, yes, we do check respiratory rate, especially on a patient who's having difficulty breathing or a patient who is unconscious or just had anesthesia. You wanna get in the habit of checking the respiratory rate. It's not gonna be 12 to 20, okay? Um, just recently, we went to the, see a patient and I told the, the students, check his respiratory rate, and it was 36, and they couldn't believe it because they get used to writing 12 to 20. I've had patients on a BiPAP breathing at 44 breaths a minute, and people are documenting you know, 20 or 18. You wanna make sure that you're counting the respirations. Get out of that habit of making numbers up, especially if a patient is having difficulty breathing. They're not gonna be 18 to 20 breaths a minute, okay? And so, how do you compare and see if they're doing better? If you don't have that baseline respiratory rate, how do you know if they're doing better? Maybe you go and count their respirations and they're breathing at 24 breaths a minute and to you, you're thinking they're very tachypneic. However, prior to you placing them on the, on the nasal cannula, they were breathing at 34 or 40. So they're actually doing better. 
okay? And so if you don't have that baseline, it's very difficult to say if your patient is doing better or not. Uh, now, I have seen people put the nasal cannula on the patient this way. And this is inappropriate, okay? Because if my patient goes to get out of bed, now this is going to jerk them back. And so we don't want that. The whole purpose of the nasal cannula is that they're a little bit more independent with it. And so it's very important that you put it on appropriately, okay? All right, so that's the nasal cannula. Now, let's say... My patient, I applied the nasal cannula and I was really looking at them. I listened to their lungs and I heard wheezing um, and I heard, you know, the patient was labored and I spoke to the provider and my provider ordered a nebulizer. Then I'm going to want this right here. Okay. Now the rest of the ones that I'm going to be showing you for the most part are going to have a mask. So the way you're going to know what it is is by looking at the adapter. You always look down here to make sure you have the appropriate device for your patient. So if you look at this one, this is your nebulizer mask, and this is where I would put my albuterol or my Rovana or whatever it is that the doctor ordered. I'm gonna put it in here. And now, the one thing I will tell you, you saw how with the nasal cannula, we turn the oxygen on and we put it on the patient first. Here, you want to put the medicine in and then connect it because if you have it going, and I'll tell you because I always tell you guys all the silly things that I've done as a nurse so that you won't do it, right? If you have it on and you put the medication in, it's going to fly, it's going to, you know, spill all over the place. So you want to put the medication in first, then you want to go and turn it on and you turn it on about to like five, six liters, enough that you're going to be able to see that aerosol mist and then you're gonna apply it to your patient, okay? And they also have the mouthpiece. Um, a lot of patients at home, that's what they'll use, the mouthpiece, but in the hospital, for the most part, these patients are very sick and it's very difficult for them to hold it, and so we'll just put the mask on. Um, I also have a pediatric mask. So remember, you wanna choose the appropriate mask size based on your patient, right? You might have a child who's bigger and needs a bigger mask, or you might have an adult who needs a smaller mask. So you wanna choose the appropriate size for your patient. And I know for peds, um, and I, I'm not a peds nurse, but I know from my own daughter, uh, they did use like kind of a blow-by because she wouldn't keep it on. She was two or three years old at the time. And so, you know, you just hold it by their face and you kind of just hold it for them, okay? So that's your nebulizer um, mask for your, your treatments. The next one we're gonna cover is your Venturi mask, okay? And here it says Venturi oxygen mask and it always comes like this. Every company, obviously, their adapters may look a little bit different, but it always comes with your five adapters. And this company is Portex, and the highest that this goes up to, the Venturi mask, or a lot of us in the hospital call it Venti mask, is 50%, okay? Based on whatever adapter you apply to your patient, it's going to deliver a certain percentage of oxygen. So remember with the nasal cannula, we were talking about liters per minute. Now we're talking about the FiO2, we're talking about percentage of oxygen being delivered to the patient. And this is very specific. Based on your patient's needs, you're gonna use the appropriate adapter. So what does that mean? Well, I have my different color adapters here. And if I look at the adapter, I will be able to see, and this adapter here, this orange one here, says 50%. And it tells me that I would need to set the flow meter for 10 liters, okay? And so what I'm doing is delivering 50% oxygen, FiO2, um, to my patient, and I'm setting the flow meter to 10 liters. But I'm not giving the patient 10 liters, I'm giving them 50% oxygen. And the way it does that is actually pretty cool. Unfortunately, I wasn't the one who thought of this, otherwise I'd be a lot richer. Um, but the way at each one, so first of all, one quick um, tip, because my students always forget that this is a Venturi mask, you notice that it has these little vents. So I always say that's how you remember that it's a Venturi mask, because it has these vents. And with these vents, that's how they regulate how much oxygen. And if you look inside, you can see that each hole is different. 
okay so let me get one that you can really see the difference so if you look at the 50 percent which is this orange one and this is 10 liters and this is 31 percent and it's six liters you can see that the whole the size is very different and so you're delivering a specific type based on this now the other thing that is super important and i often see um the venturi mask without it is this plastic adapter right here you need this because what happens is your patient might be cold your patient might have a gown or clothes and so they might obstruct the vents which will now not allow it to give the specific percentage of oxygen that you were trying to deliver and so it's very important that when you put the venturi mask on that you also apply this okay and this is the way it looks all right so the Venturi mask goes anywhere. Now, it's funny because I was reading in some of the books and it says 24 to 60%. However, I have only seen 50% in my facility and the bag that I have here as well is 50%. So if somebody knows where the 60% is coming from, if you want to write that in the comments for me, I'm always open for education. Um, but yeah, I only know it to go up to 50%, which is this orange and this is the most common one that I use in the hospital um, typically if my patient is having difficulty breathing and they're in respiratory distress and I decide to put them on a Venturi mask I'm gonna go for my orange which is 50% or my pink which is 40% and then based on their respiratory rate their pulse oximeter and their um, lung sounds and their work of breathing if they're labor the, you know the, um, they're using accessory muscles and stuff I'm gonna decide whether or not they're tolerating it, and then hopefully, eventually, they as I start to treat the cause, right? We talked about if they need Lasix or they need, um, maybe they have pneumonia, they need antibiotics, maybe they have a, a pulmonary embolism, they're getting anticoagulants, or whatever the case, as you start to treat the cause, then you start to see that your patient's um, SpO2 is getting better, and their work of breathing is better, their lungs are nice and clear, um, then you want to start titrating them down and typically you don't want to titrate them too quickly because you're anticipating that they're not going to tolerate it too well. So for example, sometimes you have a patient on 50% oxygen and you want to start seeing if they need to, you know, if they can be lowered and they can start coming off of the Venturi mask, then you might want to lower them down to a 40 Okay, so go from 50 to 40 and see how they do. Continue to assess their pulse oximeter, their SpO2, excuse me. Let's, you know, look at their work of breathing. Um, and, um, you know, you just want to make sure that you're assessing them. You don't want to take them off of the oxygen. Like, so I've had some patients where we try to um, take them off of the Venturi mask just for a couple minutes so they can maybe eat something. And within a couple of minutes, they start to desaturate you can start to see that circumoral cyanosis, you can start to see that work of breathing, and so you have to put them back on. And even if it's just, it's just for a couple minutes to get something to eat, they don't tolerate it. So just keep in mind that whenever you're starting to take someone off of the Venturi, you wanna titrate them appropriately, and you wanna be by their side assessing them because if they're gonna to tolerate the titration or not, you're gonna see it within a couple of minutes, okay? So, all right, let's say for this guy, I decided um he's a mouth breather so i could either use my simple face mask i'll have let me show you my simple face mask so i could just use my simple face mask because he's a mouth breather um but for him i don't really want to use that i'm just going to use the venturi and so i have here and these are so difficult to see but it's 28 percent and it's telling me four liters okay so i'm going to set my flow meter to four liters that little silver ball is going to go to four i'm going to connect it okay and let's say once it's connected i'm going it's not connecting but i know it's not connecting in, in the real world i would make sure it connects for some reason this one doesn't stay on and then i'm going to tell my patient i'm going to put you on this um venti mask and give you a little bit more oxygen because you're breathing through your mouth so what i mean by that is a lot of the times in the um I work nights for many years, so a lot of times my patients would breathe through their mouth, and so even though they were tolerating four liters um, while they were awake, at night you start to see their SpO2 going down, and that's because they're breathing through their mouth, and so then you might want to put them on your simple face mask, 
or your Venturi mask, okay? Now with the Venturi mask, you don't need to humidify the oxygen, um, which is another difference from the nasal cannula. All right, so what, let's review really quick. So we have the nasal cannula, which, del which delivers one to six liters per minute. Um, and you have your, we just looked at the simple face mask. I don't typically use the simple face mask where I work. Um, we don't see it often, but I know the emergency room sometimes uses it. Okay, we just covered the nebulizer. And then we just went over the Venturi. So what's next? So the next one is your non-rebreather, high concentration non-rebreather mask. Now here, this one um, has green tubing, but I, you know, most of the ones that I use in my facility has um, clear tubing. And you also notice that there's a bag in here, and that's how you know it's your non-rebreather mask. Now, when you use the non-rebreather mask, okay, it's called a non-rebreather for a reason. We want this patient to get all of the oxygen that we're delivering. And so we're um, connecting, first of all, I would connect this to the wall and it would be anywhere from 10 to 15 liters per minute. And it's typically um, 60 to 100%, 100% oxygen is the most that I would give. And I always call this my drama mask, okay? If you think about Grey's Anatomy and all your ER, Chicago MD, all of those ER shows and paramedic shows, you always see the patients have this mask, right? Because it looks dramatic. It shows me that my patient is having trouble breathing. And this patient in the real world that needs this type of mask is having trouble breathing. This is a 60 to 100%. Typically, anytime that I have, my patients have needed this, they're getting 100% oxygen. This is a patient whose O2 sat is in the 70s and we're thinking we're probably gonna intubate or they're in a, having an acute asthma attack and so we're giving them oxygen while we get the bronchial dilators on board and steroids on board. And so this patient is having trouble. So that's why I call this the drama mask. When you see a patient having this, they're having difficulty breathing, okay? However, this patient is still breathing on their own, okay? Which is different. So first of all, um, very important to note that once you connect this and the patient, you want to see this bag inflate and you want to inflate the bag, you want when the patient breathes in and out, you want it to inflate about two thirds of the bag, okay? And so you would put this on the patient, and if it was deflated like this, the way you see on TV, we don't want that. We want it to be inflating as the patient is breathing, okay? Um, and here, let me show you my pediatric. So here's my pediatric 100% um, non-rebreather. Okay, so remember I said this patient is having a lot of trouble breathing, um, but we're giving them 100% oxygen maybe before we get the BiPAP on board or before we're getting ready to intubate or while we're treating them acutely. Okay, now this next one, and I bring this one out because this one also has a bag, and so a lot of times when I pull the, the non-rebreather out in the lab, a lot of students think that it's an AMBU bag. However, this is your AMBU bag, okay? This is your AMBU bag. And here, my patient is not breathing. I'm breathing for them, okay? When I'm using this AMBU bag, you see it has this mask, and this is an adult AMBU bag. I did not bring the pediatric, but obviously if it was peds, you wanna get the appropriate size for them. And the size of the mask is really important. Um, actually, Many times in the ICU, I would ventilate patients who were either had an um, endotracheal tube or tracheotomy, um, tracheostomy tube, and so you would connect this to the tube, and it's fairly easy. However, when you are bagging a patient, especially an adult, depending on their, you know, the size of their face, depending if it's a male with a beard, it is very difficult. So if you are on a unit that requires you to do this, if you are ACLS trained, okay, if you are um, you're going for ACLS, even if BLS, you should really make sure that you get hands-on practice using this. Because the biggest thing is that I want to have a seal. I want to, I, first of all, I would put the patient flat. If I was going to really be doing this, the patient will be flat. And I'm not going to actually show you how to do this. That would be a separate video. 
but it's super important that you have a seal. And if you're feeling oxygen coming out when you're um, bagging this patient, because remember you're breathing for them, then you're not doing it effectively. So, you know, this patient is not breathing and this is typically um, the patient that you're gonna intubate. And we usually bag them before. So this is your AMBU bag. If you guys have any questions on this, I didn't want to go into detail because this is, um, you know, a little advanced for many of you. But if you have any questions, shoot me a comment. As one of my friends is a nurse anesthetist, I know he'll be so happy to give you all the information that you need. All right, so let's see. Did we cover everything? So we got the nasal cannula, which delivers one to six liters of oxygen. We have your Venturi mask which um, I'm going to say delivers 24 to 50%, but the textbook does say 60, so make sure that um, you speak to your teachers about that and, and get back to me on where that 60 is coming from. And typically that's going to um, be for um, the textbook, like I said, says 4 to 12, but on my 50%, it says 10. So just remember that with your inventory mask, you're always going to want to look to see how many liters it's telling you to deliver. Okay, then we have your nebulizer mask. Now, the nebulizer, one thing that I did miss, in the hospital, we connect it to the flow meter, okay? Like I said, remember I told you, you're gonna put it to about like five to six. You don't have to put it all the way up where it's you know popping off the wall. Um, but in the clinical area, for example, in the doctor's office or in the patient's home, usually they'll have a little nebulizer machine and so you're just gonna apply it to that. Um, the next thing was your 100% non-rebreather, and there was something that I missed that is very important. What kind of patient would I not want to put 100% non-rebreather mask on? Can somebody tell me that in the comments? What kind of patient? All right, so your COPD patient, you're not going to want to put a non-rebreather because remember, my COPD patients have problems with CO2. They retain CO2. And so you do not want to put 100% um, non-rebreather. About now, if they are having an acute exacerbation where they're hypoxic, then we want to maybe put them on a BiPAP machine. And the BiPAP is the most appropriate because it'll help to regulate that inspiration and expiration and help to um, keep them from getting, you know, basically retaining CO2. And so the BiPAP, I know, is something that we use a lot in my facility, and it's also the next best thing before intubating a patient. So many times when we don't feel that a patient is a good candidate to be intubated, we will put them on BiPAP, or if we are trying to prevent this patient from being intubated, we'll put them on the BiPAP machine, and it's pretty effective. All right, this next one I bring out because a lot of times when I pull the Venturi mask, out, page, my students get confused and they call this your um, trait collar. But so remember, this is not a trait collar because this mask is gonna go over the patient's face. And I have these vents, this is my Venturi mask. Whereas this is a trait collar and if my patient has a trach, his, he's all the way like this, he's not even prepared for this. But if he had a trach, this would go around the neck okay around the throat and this will be your respiratory therapist usually does this they'll connect this to your oxygen and you notice this container because this is always going to be humidified oxygen okay so this is where they're going to put um, the sterile water for humidified oxygen and if you notice here based on what your patient needs you're going to um, turn the dial based on your patient's needs the last thing I also wanted to um, mention, which I did not cover, is every time you walk into a patient's room for the first time, you always wanna go over to that flow meter and see what kind of oxygen they're on, um, what's the rate, and is it even connected appropriately. So sometimes your patient is getting nebulizer treatments, they have a nasal cannula, they have a Venturi mask, and there's a lot of different devices at the wall and so you always want to see okay well where is my patient and then let me follow the line the tubing and make sure that it's the appropriate one on my patient all right so with that being said i think that's it for my video if you guys have any questions or comments please shoot me a message down below and if you're liking my videos and you want more i would appreciate if you would let me know what else you want to see and if you would subscribe, because if you subscribe and hit the notifications, every time I post a video, you'll be able to um, 
get direct access to it. It'll show up on your stream right away. And I'm trying to post a video about once a week so that you know we can review some things that so many of you have forgotten or maybe have not seen yet in the clinical area. All right, so I hope you enjoy the video. And if you do, give me a thumbs up. Thank you.